Good afternoon, everyone. This afternoon, we're going to think about the question, do we need God, and look at some of the answers to it. We're going to start with this man, Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow was a 20th century psychologist who wanted to understand what motivates people. He believed that people possess a set of motivational systems unrelated to rewards or unconscious desires. He stated that people are motivated to achieve certain needs and when one need is fulfilled, a person seeks to fulfill the next one and so on. And the, the earliest and most widespread of Maslow's hierarchy of needs included five mo motivational needs, um, which are usually depicted as stages within a pyramid. Um, he sort of went on to develop his ideas slightly um, and sort of republished the paper twice. Um, first time he had one set, one additional layer, um, second time an another additional layer, but they were very much based on the, the original um, and don't add an awful lot more. So the base of the pyramid contains the, the basic physiological needs. Um, what we need as a human to keep us alive, breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep, etc. And above that, we have the need for our safety, health, employment, so that we can provide for ourselves property, family, etc. Next in line is the need for a sense of love and belonging, families, friendships, intimacy. Beyond that, he says that humans require self-esteem. They need to have a respect of others, a need for achievement. And lastly, there's the need for self-actualization. Um, I couldn't find a version of this that didn't have American spellings on it, so you'll have to forgive the American spelling. Um, but sort of realizing personal potential, self-fulfillment, seeking personal growth, um, peak experiences, that kind of thing. And within this hierarchy, the lower order needs must be met for the higher order needs to be meaningful. So if you are without food, you are not so bothered about having someone else's respect or seeking um, self-actualization. Rather, you are looking to get what you need to survive. And within all of this, Maslow has no need for religion. He doesn't see a human need for God. And we can see this in society ourselves today. We're fortunate to live in a country that's relatively pros prosperous. The vast majority of people in this country have what they need. Most people aren't struggling to put food on the table or to provide somewhere for them and their family to live. And consequently, much of the population don't see a need for God in their lives. They have what they desire. They don't feel the need to look to anything else or for anything else um, to make their lives feel complete. But despite this apparent lack of a need for anything else, throughout the Bible, God calls to us to respond to him and to follow his ways. And so the cynic might think, well, I don't really need God. Why does God need me? And the truth of the matter is that God doesn't. God doesn't need us. It's that we need God. God is good to us, but he doesn't need us. And that's something we have to understand. We read in Acts chapter 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives life and breath and everything to everyone. It can be very easy for man to be vain, to think that he does God a favour by turning to him. Someone else might think that they hurt God or diminish his power in some way by blaspheming or rejecting him. And obviously both are wrong. We look in Job 35. If you are righteous, what do you give to God? Or what does he receive from your hand? It's a rhetorical question, but the answer is obviously nothing. The verse before, if you sin, 
How does it affect God? If your transgressions are many, what does it do to him? And again, it's a rhetorical question, but the answer is, it doesn't. The, the righteous do not Im increase the power of God. The wicked do not take away from the power of God. God has existed from eternity past without our love or recognition and he will continue to exist in power and glory and might long after we are dead. God will be God forever and ever regardless of what we do or do not do. God is self-sustained in, in no way relying on man. And some might think that they are doing, a, doing God a favour by going to church or reading the Bible. Others might think they're doing him a favour by acknowledging him as the Lord of their lives. And again, it's not true, is it? They're, they're doing themselves a favour. God does not need us. We need him. God is God all by himself. He created the heavens, the earth, the sea, all that's in them. God created all the planets. God created the sun. He created light and scattered the darkness. He, he made the, the fastest animals that we can think about. He made the, the delicate butterfly. He, he made the water system. He made the, the largest animals and the tiniest microorganisms. He made the food chain. God made you. He made me. He doesn't need anything from us in order to exist. And Psalm 50 really emphasises this. God says, listen, my people, I am speaking. Listen, Israel, I am accusing you. I am God, your God. I'm not condemning you because of your sacrifices or because of your burnt offerings that you continually offer me. I do not need to take a bull from your household or goats from your sheepfold. For every wild animal in the forest belongs to me, as well as the cattle that graze on a thousand hills. Everything that we have is God's anyway. He doesn't need us for the smallest thing. And yet God gave his son to die that we might have the opportunity for life. We read Psalm 8 at the beginning, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? It's amazing to think that God is bothered about us. Why does he care what we do? Why does he think about us? I suppose it brings us to think about why God made us in the first place. Revelation 4 verse 11 we read, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive honour, glory and honour and power, for you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. God made us for his pleasure, not because he needed us. God hasn't changed. He still wants the pleasure of our fellowship and love. And what does God require from us? Micah 6 verse 8, he's told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord really wants from you. He wants you to promote justice, to be faithful and to live obediently before your God. And in spite of what God has done for us, we still reject him. Mankind lives without regard for his statutes, his commandments, his precepts, his laws. We often want him to stay out of our affairs so that we can do what we want to do. Man is lawless and rebellious so much of the time. The, the violence, the despair, the loneliness, the drunkenness that we see in the world around us isn't God's fault. They're the, the fruits of us doing things our own way and disregarding God's word. So it's not us that needs God, it's, sorry, it's not God that needs us, it's us that needs God. But you might say, hold on a minute, we live in a country where for the most part we have what we need, technology is increasing at a rate that we can't keep up with, everyday things that are, in, are invented and discovered that make our lives easier, more fulfilling, and generally better. Does anyone know who this man is? Very, very famous man. Benjamin Franklin, yes. Um, and he has some very famous words. He said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death, 
and taxes. The advances in science and technology and medicine mean that the average lifespan and life expectancy is going up, but not only that, the quality of people's lives are increasing. The chart shows the last 50 years and the, the projected increase over the next 30, 40 years or so. And the changes are massive and they're not just in the developed world either, they're across all the regions of the world. Life expectancy has increased by about the 15 years. But as Benjamin Franklin said, death is a certainty for all of us. And this is where we, we truly do need God. Despite all of the advances in science and technology and medicine, we still know that one day we will die. But God offers us eternal life in his kingdom. Some of the most famous words in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In God's kingdom, lifespans won't be limited as they are now. We have the opportunity for eternal life. And in the kingdom, life will be very different to the life we experience now. If you look in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, But those who wait for the Lord's help find renewed strength. They rise up as if they had eagle's wings. They run without growing weary. They walk without getting tired. Just imagine that we will be able to run without getting weary. In a fit of optimism, I entered the London Marathon for 2015. Um, fortunately, I think, I didn't get in um, because I've not been running for quite a few weeks and I certainly can't run without getting weary. There are... Sorry... Um, the Bible promises, though, that in the kingdom we will have renewed strength. We won't be limited by the, the same constraints that we find ourselves limited by now. Because does God ever get tired? Of course not. Um, verse 28 and... Sorry, I've written verse 31 on there. It's not verse 31, it's verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard... The Lord is an eternal God, the creator of the whole earth. He does not tired, get tired or weary. There is no limit to his wisdom. He gives strength to those who, that, who are tired, to the ones who lack power. He gives renewed energy. And in the kingdom, God will share some of that power so that we won't get tired, we won't get weary, we won't be constrained in the same way that we are now. But there are people who would love to have the opportunity to get tired from running. People who, for whom that has never really been a possibility. Some people are born with disabilities. Others might become disabled in some way by, by an accident, maybe temporarily, broken leg or, or more permanently. Others struggle with hearing, with, with sight. Let's look what life in the kingdom will be like for this group of people. Isaiah 35, strengthen the hands that have gone limp, steady the knees that shake, then blind eyes will open, deaf ears will hear, then the lame will leap like a deer, the mute tongue will shout for joy, for water will flow in the desert, streams in the wilderness. So Isaiah 35 tells us that anyone who can't see in the kingdom, they'll be able to see, likewise those who are deaf will be able to hear. Those who can't walk will be able to walk. It says they'll be leaping like a deer, and if you just think how deers leap about, imagine the joy that people will have going from being lame to jumping around like a deer. And those people who can't speak in the kingdom, they'll be able to sing to be able to praise God with their voices. So all the disabilities that we see in the world around us today will be changed in the kingdom. There will be no disability anymore. We know that when Jesus was on the earth, he performed miracles like this. The lame man was healed. The blind man was made to be able to see again. The deaf man was made to hear. In the, in the kingdom, these miracles will take place, but on a much larger scale. 
Sadly, there are many people in the world who go hungry each day. There are many countries who do not have the things that we have. Every day, about 16,000 children die of hunger. A sixth of the world's population, just over a billion people around the world, are hungry. And if we look in Psalm 72, may there be an abundance of grain in the earth, on the tops of the mountains may it sway, may its fruit trees flourish like the forests of Lebanon, may its crops be as abundant as the grass of the earth. I wouldn't say that I'm a massive walker, but I've been walking in the mountains in this country, and the mountains in this country are sort of relatively small, aren't they, compared to most countries' mountains. And yet, even in this country, there's almost not, nothing on the top of mountains. Very little grows there. Psalm 72 tells us that in the kingdom there will be an abundance of grain in the earth, even some growing on the tops of the mountains. Now, many of the people in the world who go hungry do so because the area that they live in struggles to produce food, sometimes because of famine and drought, sometimes because of flood. In the kingdom, the earth's climate will be very different. There will be grain growing even in the most inhospitable places on the earth, the tops of the mountains. The deserts will be very different as well. Places like the, the Sahara Desert in Africa, that's over 9 million square kilometres, um, making it about the same size as the United States or the entirety of the continent of Europe. Let the desert and dry region be happy. Let the wilderness rejoice and bloom like a lily. Let it richly bloom. Let it rejoice and shout with delight. It is given the grandeur of Lebanon, the splendour of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the grandeur of the Lord, the splendour of our God. So what was barren and fruitless before will change in the kingdom. In the kingdom, the desert will be blooming and fruitful. The food will be able to grow in the desert regions. And all this reminds us how God originally created the earth. After creation, God said that the earth was very good. In the kingdom, I think the earth will return to the state like in the Garden of Eden. So in the kingdom, there will be plenty of food for everyone. Allegedly, there is now enough food in the world for everyone. But the problem that there is, is greed. Some countries, us for example, have more than we can eat. And if you just think about what we throw away each day. Some people in the world have so much compared to others. Half the world's population live on less than $2 a day. The gross domestic product of the poorest 48 nations is less than the combined wealth of the world's three richest people. <coughs> her profits and earnings will be set apart from the Lord. They will not be stored up or accumulated, for her profits will be given to those who live in the Lord's presence and will be used to purchase large quantities of food, as the AV has it, to eat sufficiently, and beautiful clothes. And this chapter is talking about Tyre. Um, it's one of the rich nations at the time. But I think what's being said can be applied to all the rich nations in the world. In the kingdom, all the wealth that the rich countries have at the moment will be shared out far more evenly throughout the world so that everyone can eat sufficiently and have enough clothing. In the kingdom, the world's economy will be changed massively so this greed is done away with. Professor of Psychology Mark McKinn of George Fox University in Oregon writes, The idea of admitting that one is needy is not popular in contemporary Western society. We see it as a sign of weakness and vulnerability. Some people build persuasive arguments that emotional health comes with autonomy and individuality. But to the Christian, there is only one way to spiritual health. And that requires us to recognise that we need God. Spiritual leaders throughout history have written about their brokenness and hunger for God, describing an awareness of personal need as a prerequisite for spiritual growth. 
And as we would expect, the, the Bible is filled with testimonies from believers who confess that they really need God. The psalmist wrote, As a deer longs for stream of, streams of waters, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, for the living God. I say, when will I be able to go and appear in God's presence? Jeremiah declares the words of God in Jeremiah 29 verse 13 you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart Jesus taught that man does not live by bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God one of the the early church fathers as they're they termed Augustine summarized it well when he said the heart is restless until it's fine until it finds its rest in God. What's often not appreciated is the fact that the need for God is not limited, as some sometimes suggest, to unthinking, uncritical religious people. Some of the world's greatest minds, including the founders of most areas of modern science, confess their need. The list includes... <laughs> Galileo Galilei, Nicholas Copernicus, William Kelvin, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Blase Pascal, René Descartes, Gottfried Leibniz, John Locke, Soren Kierkegaard. And one can hardly claim that intellectual deficiency led these people to their perceived need for God. God is real. God wants us to recognise him. God wants us to respond. Not because it will benefit God in any way, but like any parent, God wants us to achieve the, the best we are able to. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you.